Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 254. I didn't learn how to make a movie in film school. What I learned in film school was to express yourself with pictures and sound. But learning to make films is totally different. Martin Scorsese. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Black Box. Black Box is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blockbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Black Box, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Black Box takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Unknown is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Known can help you with all of your post-sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley, ADR, and even a custom score. Contact Studio Known and mention the Indie Film Also podcast, and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post-sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. Now, today on the show, we have Brandon Riley, who is a first assistant director, and I wanted to have him on the show because wanted to kind of put a spotlight on first assistant directors and their importance and how to do it properly. We discuss how not to do it properly. And uh, sometimes you need them, sometimes you don't. But if you can afford it, you should always have one because they are wonderful uh, and very helpful if you've got the right one. And I've shot with with first ADs, without first ADs, with good first ADs, with bad first ADs, and with legendary first ADs. So if you can afford it, definitely use one. So Brandon and I get into the weeds about what a first AD really does, how to do the job. And if you're interested, if you're listening out there, and this might be interesting to you to become a first AD and how becoming a first AD can get you into the Directors Guild, which hopefully maybe leads you into other work down the line, uh, it's a very interesting conversation. So without any further ado, please enjoy my talk with Brandon Riley. I'd like to welcome to the show Brandon Riley, man. Thank you so much for jumping on the show with me, man. Thanks, Alex. Glad to be here. We never had a first AD on the show, so I'm going to beat you up on how to do it properly because I've been with too many who don't do it properly. <laughs> well, so, hope I can help. <laughs> uh, no worries, man. So how did you get into uh, the film business in the first place? Well, you know, it's a funny story. When I was seven years old, I met a famous film producer um, he was a son of um, Michael Illich, who owns Little Caesars Pizza. Mm-hmm. And I told my dad, "It's like I want to be a film producer too." And, and my dad was like, "Sure, you can do that." And so, you know, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, "I, I can do this," you know. And and you know, um, you know, in junior high and high school, I, I got involved in journalism. I really became obsessed with story and and telling stories and taking pictures, and, and um, that was something that interested me. Mm-hmm. So fil- filmmaking was this natural thing that um, it, I was, you know, obsessed about. Um, you know, went went to film school, um, did the typical thing. Kind of regretted it. Kind of didn't. <laughs> you know, I, I I don't know if it was helpful. Um, you know, because I feel like I can learn more in a film set than I can in three years of film school. Um, I, I, but, I would I would agree with you on that, bro. I w- honestly, I would agree with you. I went to film school too, and everything I learned. Uh, you know what I learned in film school? How to wrap a cable. Right. That was really important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing about film school you learn is is writing. I think, and that's that's helping me today because and how to think. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I studied philosophy as well, and you know, I'm working on helping people with scripts and different things like that. And I think that's one thing it's hard to pick up. You know. Um, so yeah, I did the film school thing and then I worked, you know, as a videographer for several years, just doing lots of random 
videos, mm -hmm. corporate corporate videos, commercials, um, all types of things. But I was wearing a lot of hats. You know, I was like writing and shooting and editing and and you know, mostly editing and and hating that. And <laughs> um, you know, spending you know twelve hours in a dark room. Um, so I, I was like, I need to do the move to LA. So and that's what I did. So I saved up some money, moved to LA, and 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 I um, did, couldn't find a job, couldn't get anything really, you know. And um, so I started driving cars and um, as a valet driver. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what you want to do after film school is, is, is drive cars. Ob obviously, uh, <laughs> because that's going to help you pay back that, that student debt quicker. Right, ex exactly. So, But then I got my first break uh, working for free on a TV pilot as, <laughs> as a grip. I, right? love, I love that. I love that you just said, I got my big break working for free. <laughs> yeah. So that was the big break, was, was working for free as a grip. Right. And I did that for half a day before they realized that I sucked at a, as a grip, but they needed somebody in the camera department. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I can do that because I did that a little bit in college because I used to think I wanted to be a DP. <clears throat> and so so I did that camera AC thing. Um, and after that show, working for free, I got like, you know, paid jobs, right? And the paid jobs paid a lot of money, like 50 bucks a day. Like, Holy cow. Uh, what are you going to do yeah. with all that cash? You <laughs> better find some tax havens, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm continuing to like valet drive and work $50 a day on all these films as a camera AC. And then actually my, my big break came was the DP that I was working as an AC from she was married to a producer and he was about to produce some indie horror film and and I somehow convinced him to let me first AD his movie, right? Mm -hmm. And and I'd never first AD before. I'd never second AD before. I'd never really been a PA on a set. Mm -hmm. um, but he believed in me, and so it was great. Um, so the movie was a six-day shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we shot a movie in six days. Um, so it was very challenging. You know, I was wearing... Um, 45 hats. Uh, so... <laughs> Hold one second. My alarm is going off for some reason. Um, so yeah, wearing 45 hats, you know, we're shooting like 12 pages a day. It was, it was nuts. Um, but that's what, where I got my first big break. I feel like, cause after that I got the second job and the third job and the fourth job. Um, and so then I've been working as an AD, um, for many years and I got into the director's guild. Um, and, and then I started producing, um, now I'm in the producer's guild. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm I'm also trying to develop my own projects and and you know working with other people, writing scripts and do, doing that. Um, and so that's kind of my journey um, in a nutshell. Well, you know, I was, um, like I was telling you before uh, when we were off air, I was telling you that you are the definition of hustle. I mean, if if you go to his IMDb guys, and I'll put it in the show notes, it's insane. Like you've just like constantly working. It, it it was it was pretty remarkable, and all the other stuff that you do on the side. As well, you definitely are a hustler, and you got to be in this business without question. Well, yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. Last year, maybe it was two years ago, I, I was I was not working, and I got I saw this thing on Facebook, and it was like, hey, we need a first CD to cover our first CD. Got sick, right? Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is me. I can do this, right? So, <laughs> so I emailed the guy. I was like, I'm your guy, and um, and and then the next morning they call. I was like, how fast can you be here? Because it's in Vegas, and like. Um, I'll be there in how, how four, hours? Four, four hours, three hours. <laughs> right. Sure. So like, yeah, I pack my bag like in one hour, fly to, <laughs> and then drive, drive to Vegas and then, <laughs> and then continue. And I jump on set and, and try to get things going. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do that show. And then the next show after that was the, I had, they had fired a first AD. And so I, I, it, that sh the next show was in Atlanta, but it was starting like a day after this other show in Vegas. Mm -hmm. So I had essentially like have no prep on both of these shows, and it's just like one thing after. Them. And there's so many p things like that where it's like you have to make these decisions: are you gonna, you know, <laughs> do this or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, but yeah, it was definitely I had to hustle to get those, you know. Now let so, me let me ask you a question because a lot of people listening don't know what is the job of a first assistant director or first AD. Right. So, in my opinion, the, the job of the first AD is really to make it so the director can focus on the creative, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and he's not worried about logistics. 
We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So, um, cause if you try to do both, it's just so much for one person. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I try to put out as many fires as possible. And, and so I'm on the radio, um, talking to the second AD and the second second, and I'm talking to the PAs and all the other departments saying, Hey, um, bring this actor. Uh, we're going to do a blocking. And, and what, how are we doing on the next scene? I'm talking to the costume designer and saying, hey, uh, we're having to change this wardrobe. Can you get a different look? And, and while the director is talking to the DP about the shot, he's not having to worry about that logistical thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, when I do work as a first AD, I'm working very close with the DP and the director, and we're making – we're essentially working as a team to make all these decisions. Like how do we get through the day? You know? Um, and so, some first ADs have a, a certain way where, you know, people have heard the first ADs scream and yell and some are very ca- calm or assertive. Right. And, you know, I try to be in, in, in between. I don't try to yell or anything, but so, you know, the first ADs can sometimes be looked at as the bad guy, you know? Well, you guys um, are, you guys, you're, you're, you're the party <laughs> pooper, man. You guys are the party poopers, but you need that. You need an adult on set. <clears throat> and a lot of times the director and the actors and the DP are all in the creative mode and like, let's just get this shot. And that's going to only take four hours. I'm like, well, then we're out of ske- our schedules off. And that's, that's your job. Yeah. And I think what's, what's difficult about it is you have to be very diplomatic because oh, God. You, 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 can't, you can't just say, <laughs> hey, you can't just say to the director, hey, we're moving moving on, you know, know. because it's, it's really the director's decision, whether you're moving on or not. You're just there to tell them, Hey, if you don't, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I just, I inform him, Hey, I think we're behind, or in my opinion, we are behind. Um, we, we, is there a way that we can catch up, you know? And so it's, and you know, I want to be there with solutions too. Like, well, here's a couple of things. Could we do this in a one or, you know, could we, (laughs) right. right. Instead of of 45 takes on 45 different angles. Can we just do this in a one and move on? Yeah. Or yeah. You know, it's having those lunch meetings with the DP and the director. Like what can we do to, to make, come up, with the rest of the day, you know. No, so the, and, and le, uh, I want you. I want to kind of focus in on this because a lot of first-time directors and filmmakers or inexperienced directors don't understand the importance of the schedule. They don't understand that you've got a, an eight-hour, ten-hour, twelve-hour day, and if you're shooting a feature, then if you are, if you like first day, you're behind a page. Well, you've got to make that page up somewhere. If by day two you've you're now behind two pages. So let's say that's three pages down. You're never going to finish the movie. If you keep going down this path, you're never going to finish the movie and the whole thing's going to become a fiasco. Right. And, and that's the job of the first AD is to kind of really hone in on, look, we've got to make the day. And, and, a good, and a good director, a seasoned director understands that, correct? Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, but some of them don't care, you know, so it's, <laughs> it's a kind of a thing where, you know, you have to be the middleman between the director and the producer. Like, can we even go over, you know? And so it's like, yeah. well, we'll go t- you know, they'll ask me, we'll go talk to the producer, say we need the shot. And then I'll go talk to the producer and they'll say, we'll go back to the director and say, we don't have the money for the shot. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things of, you know, you're trying to be the peacekeeper essentially um, and, and, and keep things moving. Um, but, you know, I'm always trying to fight for the best movie. You know, right, right. and sometimes the best movie needs to go in overtime. Sometimes, yep. you know, the best movie needs more extras and more money, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I do sometimes go to the producers and say, hey, I know that you guys budgeted 100 extras for this movie. I did my math. I sat with the director. I came out with 140. You know, can we find a way to increase the budget on this category? You know, so it's it's um, it's being realistic and, you know, instead of like saying, okay, we only have 100 to work with. I guess we'll just have to live with it, you know, Um, (laughs) (laughs) or do some visual effects. (laughs) Right. Now, now, can you explain um, how a first AD breaks down a script, which I know that's a a mystery to a lot of filmmakers. We're like, oh, you give it to a first AD. Oh, I need the script broken down. What is that exactly? 
You know, it's actually a lot easier than people think it is, mm-hmm. but you know, I get hired all the time to, to just do a script breakdown and a budget, um, you know, probably on a monthly basis, people call me like, Hey, can you do a schedule and a budget? Um, so the easiest way to explain it is, you know, you look at every scene in a script and we have to have a scene number and, and we look for how, how long is the scene? Is, is it five eighths of a page? Mm-hmm. Who's in the scene? You know, we have, you know, John, Mary and, and, um, Joseph, <laughs> Joseph, right. <laughs> Three wise men, right? Yes, exactly. Um, so, and then, you know, what, are there any props in the scene? Are, uh, where is the scene? Is What location is, you know, where is, there, is it at? Is there stunts uh, in the scene? Is there, is there stunts? In the scene, right? Yeah. So, and, and then the program that we use is called Movie Magic Scheduling is, is the main program. There's other ones like mm-hmm. Synchronize. Um, but Gorilla, right. But the nice thing about Movie Magic is because so many people have it, if you send them the file, they can easily open it. It's, Whereas, the, it's, like, the, it's the industry standard. Yeah. Um, so that's the nice thing about it. Um, yes, it's it's kind of antiquated, but it's, it's still it's a cool software. Well, you know, when I was when I was in college, I didn't really know much about assistant directing or movie magic. So I was like, how do people do this thing? Like you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's there's YouTube videos that EP puts out that you can watch and, and learn. But the other thing is like you can you can ask a first AD like, hey, will you show me a little bit of this? And it only takes like five minutes to show you the program, essentially. Mm-hmm. You know, but once you get the hang of it, it's not difficult. I think what's difficult is once you break it down, is moving the strips around and yes. actually sc- scheduling it because that's that's where the producers will get on the phone with you and be like, okay, well, we have 15 days, but this actor can only work three days and this actor can only work four days and the, you know, we, we can only be on this location on this one day. And so the, all these parameters come into play when you actually, actually start shooting mm-hmm. that aren't involved when the film is actually budgeted. And, um, you know, so that, that can create a real nightmare. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> almost, no, no, without question. So, yeah. The schedule in general, though, is like a living, breathing thing. It's constantly changing. It's constantly moving around because there's so many parameters uh, that affect it. Like, uh, like, oh, the, oh, this actor is now leaving a day early, and the other actor is coming in a day early. So now we got to change that around. And oh, the location dropped. We got to move to another location. Oh, there's rain coming, and there's there's so so many things, especially in a feature when you're thirty days, forty five days, you know, five weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. There's so many different parameters, and I can only imagine on those like two hundred million dollar movies. Oh, I know <laughs> they have to have like an army of ads to just kind of because that's like moving a, a independent uh, you know film uh, as an ad. I'm imagining is, you know, it's a smaller ship, so you can cut and, and you're kind of speedboat. But when you're moving that two hundred million dollar visual effects extravaganza, it's like moving a carrier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, the movie Dunkirk, they had you know five different countries they shot in so i mean can you imagine but you know as a ad as the first ad i think it's almost like 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 a ship commander Mm -hmm. you know or you know like a battle commander where you're 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 all about strategy right Mm -hmm. and how how are you going to win the battle so you know every day on the film set feels like a battle sometimes (laughs) i don't know about you every day every day (laughs) every day you go in and you're just like all right it's not going to come out the way I planned. It's, right. My, I'm not going to get all my shots. Let's just do what we can and let's move forward on it. And and yeah, you you just don't know. It's just so many. Yeah. There's just too many parameters, man. There's just too many right. parameters of things just and, happening. Yeah. So if you if you take all that all that responsibility and try to force it on a director, mm-hmm. it's just too much for one person to think about. You know, it's like. I'm I'm overloaded just thinking about logistics. I, it's I can't think about the creative, you know. And I've done um, it. And I've done it. It is not easy <laughs> on, a small, on smaller things. On smaller things, not yeah. on a feature or anything, but right. on smaller things. Well, actually, I did do it on a feature once, but um, <laughs> and it, but it was a very controlled, very small situation, so I was able to do it. But I've right. also been doing it for twenty odd years, so I it's a little bit different. But yeah. it is not easy. No, it's not. I much rather have a good first AD. Right. Yeah, because even if I was directing something, I'd want a first AD, you know, just because you want the freedom to be creative and not have to think about who do I need to bring to set next, and because mm-hmm. you, because you, you're try, as a director, you're constantly thinking about 
Um, is this scene work? You know. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Is the acting good? Um, what's the shot like talking to the DP? You know, so there's already, and then you have a hundred different questions from each department, you know, they're trying to answer. So, um, I, I, I love being a first AD, but it's, it's also very stressful sometimes. So I think sometimes (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how you guys do it. I I have no idea how you guys do it in general. And you were, you said, you said something earlier Well, there's two things I wanted to kind of touch that you said earlier, um, that you could show, uh, you know, a filmmaker or a producer or director how to use movie magic, but that's just a piece of software. Whereas in the art form, of using that to schedule is something that it takes years to an experience to be able to do. Cause you know where there's going to be, Oh, there's, there's a pitfall right there. Oh, there's a cliff that we don't want to go over. Um, yeah. but that's just, you know, so it just because you might know the software doesn't mean that you can schedule your own movie. If you have no experience, right. do you agree? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You could do a rough schedule, any big new rough schedule, but sure in terms of like budgeting something. Mm-hmm. Um, but like st- even stuff like understanding how to shoot a split or nights or how much night you actually need before you can start shooting, mm-hmm. you know? So if the sun sets at seven forty eight, I know that we can probably start shooting around eight thirty. Mm-hmm. If, if we're, you know, going full speed, we can't start shooting at seven thirty just because of my experience is too bright. Mm-hmm. So, um, those are the types of things that you just – it takes years of experience and and you kind of learn you know, on the job really as a, working as a second or, or, or as a first, you know, um, just collaborating with other ADs and being like, hey, well, what about this and this? You know? And that's the, one, the other thing I like about it is you, you are working with other people and, and bouncing ideas off. Um, so It's problem solving. You're trying to yeah. – we're all just trying to get across the, across the river. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, in general, that's what I see my job primarily as is a problem solver as a first AD or a line producer. Mm-hmm. I'm I, there's like a list of a hundred problems and I've got to solve them. And, and that's what I like about it. Now you also <laughs> mentioned the, uh, about yellers and screamers and also quiet first ADs. Uh, I've had all, I've worked with all, I can't stand yellers because right. I, I feel personally it doesn't, it doesn't really – for at least for my sets. I mean if you're on a Joe Pickett set, that might be different. Um, <laughs> um, but if you're um, – by the way, guys, Joe Pickett, look him up. He's a very famous commercial director uh, and the stories will speak for themselves. Um, but, uh, but generally speaking, I like to have a really cool, calm, relaxed, have a fun kind of atmosphere. And when, and when I always found that when I see First ADs yelling is because they're losing control and this is now their last – uh, last line of defense but there are also times where i kind of see where it's needed so there is a balance but generally speaking the quiet controlled first ad's who know what they're doing uh and and have the respect of the crew which is a huge thing uh if you lose if you lose your crew you're done as a first ad right yeah, and I think there's a difference between yelling and, and being loud because yes. sometimes you ha- you have to be loud and be like if you're op- in a loud in open space on a mm-hmm. field, you know you might have to use a megaphone. You might oh, have course. to you know do this. Um, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, there's no reason to to yell, and it, and and honestly, it, it, like you said, it makes people feel like you're out of control. Um, and with a season so, with a season crew, the season crew will eat you alive. I, I mean, a, yeah. a, a, a seasoned Hollywood crew. <clears throat> With a, a yelling first AD who's inexperienced, they'll, it's done. They just yeah. – they'll just go on doing their own thing and they'll ignore them, which happened to me on a right. few sets. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing that I try to do on on every movie um, is I meet with the director and the DP and myself if, if, if I'm the first AD or the producer. And we have a, a little powwow and we talk about how do we want the set to be run. Mm-hmm. You know, because I think sometimes, I mean, you're all coming together. You never work with, with each other for the most part, unless you, you have before. Mm-hmm. And so everybody has these different assumptions. You mm. know, some some first time directors think that they're supposed to direct the extras when that's really like <laughs> the, the, the AD's job. Yeah. So 
sometimes there's, it's like an educational meeting. I was like, okay, so, and then I asked the director, how do you want the set to be run? You know, what, what, what do you want? And then I'll, and I'll talk about like what some of my expectations are, you know, mm-hmm. that if, if we feel behind, how are we going to address it on the day? You know, mm-hmm. just, and, and that's like an hour meeting. And that hour meeting has really changed the way I work because, because we can point back to that meeting. I hey, remember when we talked about that or just knowing that they know that, Hey, we're going to set the extras. You don't have to worry about that. But if you want to, you want to help us figure out this one piece, you know, get dirty, let us know. Um, and, and I think that, that, that's been the helping helpful for me, I guess. Yeah, again, communication always is a big help <laughs> yeah. when, when when working on a set. Now, can you you you've mentioned second second ads and third ads? What are the what are the differences between the multiple? And I've seen many multiple versions of ads uh, out on the set. Yeah, it's funny. I've actually never been a second second, so I, I'm I can tell you a little about it, but I've never done mm-hmm. it. Um, and it's it's mostly have to do with you know working with the background actors Mm -hmm. and um, working with talent. And, you know, if you have 300 extras that day, you might have several second seconds Mm -hmm. and they're just all giving the background, they're setting background, they're giving them direction, they're wrangling them. Are they, Um, would would you consider them like glorified PAs at that point? Because I've heard that like a lot of PAs just go like, okay, you're the second second today. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's, it's a credit that's given to a PA if you don't have, a second second mm-hmm. um it's it's really the first ad's right hand man on set a mm-hmm. lot of times you know um in terms of a lot of times the second ad's at base camp doing a call sheet mm-hmm. um and sometimes the, the second ad is on set helping with background different things but a lot of times that they're so much paperwork that they're just not able to be on set as much sure and then a third ad is the same thing as a second second it's just in a different country they call them different things mm-hmm. so like in uk they might call them a third ad got it um so or a fourth ad or whatever like. well sometimes you might need it because there's like five thousand people that you're, you're trying to wrangle well yeah and in the u.s we wouldn't we wouldn't have a third or fourth we'd have like an additional second ad mm-hmm. you know and then we'd have a second second, and if you could have an additional second second, stuff like that. Sure, exactly. Uh, and sometimes you might have two first ads if it's a TV show and they're rotating and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So um, it gets really complicated. <laughs> now you but, also now you also do line producing. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what the job of a line producer is versus a UPM? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not the best at under, explaining that, but I'll do my best. Sure. Yeah. So, so the line producer, you know, in my opinion, starts early on with the film, and and they might open bank accounts, they might uh, make get the tax incentives, get all the accounts opened, and and then um, handle the budget, uh, do do a lot of the major hires, and then a UPM would come on later in the game, and um, take over some of those responsibilities, you know, in terms of hiring the crew, managing payroll, working with the accountants and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, really that the, the two overlap a lot. Um, but on a big show, I think they're important to have both because there's so much to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you can, you can't, you don't want to just have another PA, you know, you don't want, no, you want no, some, no, 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 no. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I did a show for the CW where I was the line producer and we had a UPM and we kind of, split responsibilities a little bit and it was very helpful because you know i i I was busy all day you know um but there's some shows where i don't have a upm it's just kind of i'm the line producer and that's that's what it is um and for everybody listening a upm is a unit production manager uh, because a lot of people don't know what a upm is in general now what uh what is the dga and how does a first ad get into the dga so the DJ is the Directors Guild of America, and it's the union for directors, ADs, and UPMs. And line, and, line, line producers and UPMs, right? Well, so line producers are not, not actually in a union. Okay. So um, they're, they're the one of the few categories that don't have a union. Same right. thing as pr- producers aren't in a union, although you can join the Producers Guild, but that's more of a club. Kind of like the, and, ASC, like the ASC. Yeah, so I'm in the Producers Guild, but – uh, yeah, I'm in a club basically. You're not so, getting a, you're not getting a pension. You're not getting a pension from the the producers right. guild. I mean, it's a cool club to be a part of. Don't oh, get absolutely. Me wrong. Um, 
There's lots of parties and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> so, so the way you get into the DGA is very complicated, but the easiest way is to get into the DGA training program. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And that happens every year. You, I think applications end around April or May, mm-hmm. and and essentially they take like twenty people. Um, they accept, you know, out of hundreds of applications. And if you get accepted, then you get like two or three years of work, and you work on big shows and TV shows as a trainee, trainee assistant mm-hmm. or assistant assistant trainee. And um, and then it, you you know you're set for life pretty much because you built contacts and. You know, you can easily step in to be a second AD and then go be a first. Um, I did did not do that. I tried, but I was not qualified enough. Um, so, and, and the reason they they don't always pick who you think they're going to pick. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they pick people with no film experience at all. Right. So you so you really don't know who who these people are going to pick. And um, so. I didn't let that discourage me, <laughs> but um, so you can get on. The other option is to get on a show that flips, you mm-hmm. know, and that's how I got on. I was um, on a show where the UPM, I was hired before the UPM, and the UPM was a DGA UPM, and she wanted to make the show part of the union, and so that would mean that I would have to join, and so I joined. Now, um, when you when you flip a show, that's generally not a depending on the perspective, it's not a good thing sometimes. Well, there's different flippings, I guess. Flipping for the DGA is only like three people or four people. Right. It's, it's, like not, a, it's, it's not like uh, IATSE. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's director, UPM first and second mm-hmm. um, or second, second. Um, but yeah, the IATSE, which covers the rest of the crew, mm-hmm. except for Teamsters, you know, that that's where people, and they talk, mostly talk about flipping. That's what they mostly refer to. Um, cause you really can't, it's really weird for a show to flip DJ. It, it was, so I guess it wasn't really flipped. It was more of just, I was grandfathered in essentially. Right. Um, you snuck in the back then, door. You snuck in the back yeah, door. <laughs> so that's how I got in. And then the other way to get in is through working as a PA. Yes. Um, yes I remember that. And, and like you, you get like six, 600 days or something like that. And on, have to be on some commercial QL, um, and you can call – if you have questions, you can call the DGA Q, QL mm-hmm. website, and, and they'll kind of walk you through how to be qualified. It's important, though, to keep call sheets and, and, you have paychecks, to get the proof, and yeah. paycheck stubs because yeah. mm-hmm. um, if, you, if you can't prove that you worked, um, they'll, they'll kick off some of your days. You know, um, So, so if, you, if you PA for 600 days and you can prove it with call sheets and pay stubs, that's a way in – to the DGA to get in, but that's a long, that's a long way around. Yeah. I mean, the other way, like I was working was collecting days as a non-union first AD. Mm-hmm. And then I'm able to basically cash those days in to be listed as a certain QL, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, that's the DJ is very complicated. Um, <laughs> because it's know, a wonder, it, because it's a wonderful union once you're in yeah. I mean, the, the pension is insane. The medical yeah. is insane. Um, it's one of the best unions in the business period. Yeah, it, it really is a great union. Although it, it's sometimes tough because you can't take other work. You can't right. take non-union, non-union work. And whereas if I go work, if I'm an IOTC member, a lot of times they don't care as much, you know? Right. Um, and I didn't really know that going into it, but <laughs> I know I know now. So, yeah. Uh, now, let me ask you a question. How do you handle a director that is just breaking down and completely losing control on set? Is there anything the first AD can do to help? Um, because I'm sure you've been on projects where the, it's a first-time director or he's having a bad day or he's having a bad movie. Uh, and it's just completely just breaking down. Losing control. What is there anything you can do to help? You know, I don't know if it. I mean, losing control. I don't know about as much as out of control. I mean, maybe it's more of I've dealt with directors that are yelling and screaming and okay. firing firing people. <laughs> okay, so out of so so out of control. So out of control. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I mean that that's always a tough thing because you know you, you everybody wants to keep their job, you know. So it's like. Um, 
I, but at the same time, the director will listen to me where they might not listen to the third PA, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's, it's challenging because you, you have to pull them aside and be, and be like, Hey, I, I know, I know you're upset. She, like there was this one instance where this actor, we thought that she cut her hair and he just wanted to get rid of her. And, um, you know, it was an African American a actress and she didn't, she didn't really cut her hair. It was like they had these braids things, mm -hmm. you know? So, <laughs> right. but I was like, it's like, if we fire this actress, we're going to have to reshoot these two days of stuff that oh we've already shot. I was like, I was thousands so, I was like, of dollars. Thousands right. It's like, I was like, and we don't have the time or this, the money. It's like, so, you know, so in that instance, I was able to convince him not to fire her. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just, it was just logic. It was logical. <laughs> right. But it's like, sometimes, you know, and there are, there are a few directors that are bipolar just because <laughs> it, it, the profession attracts some people um, that are, are highly creative, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I've worked with many of these guys and, and so that's challenging too, mm -hmm. you know? So <clears throat> I think, you know, it's trying to be the calm one on set is, is my goal is trying to, okay, I know we're this, this huge problem is in front of us, but let's, let, let's think about it. Cause if, if we're, if we're being loud and, and, um, angry about it, it's not going to solve itself, you know? So, um, I, I just try to come up with as many solutions as possible and, and talk to him in a calm, assertive way. And, um, I don't know if that's answering the question, but it, it is, it is, it is. I mean, it's, 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 a <clears throat> it's tough when you have an out of control director. It's kind of like having an out of control general, like, yeah. you know, all of a sudden they're firing people or attacking places that they shouldn't be attacking uh, as a right. general. So yeah. the same thing goes with a director. He, he could, out of control director can bring down the entire movie within minutes. Uh, yeah. And it's tough. And then you're stuck in the middle between the producer and, oh God, there's so much drama that could happen uh, right. on set when you, when, when you have people like that. Now, right. can you tell me a little bit about assisting directing.com, your website? So yeah, it's just a little site that I created a couple years ago. It was funny. The domain was available and I was like, I just got to buy this thing. Um, and I just put blogs and articles and some downloads on there. Uh, to help others that are wanting to get into assistant directing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just have – every time I, I go work on a film set, I learn something new, and I was like, oh, this could be a post, and I post it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a friend of mine contact me today, and he's an AD friend of mine, but he's producing a movie. He's like, where do you get non-union extras? <laughs> and I was like, well, I, I – and I was like, I do – fine, use LA Casting when I'm in Los Angeles. And so that was – you know, but I was like, that, that's a, like another topic for a blog post is mm -hmm. fi finding non-union extras. And I have that, I have a couple of those posts, but, um, I don't know. I just, I feel there's value in sharing knowledge and experiences with, with others. And, you know, I, I wrote a book kind of about my experience. Yeah. Can you tell me about um, your book? Yeah. So it's called the career, the career chose me. And it just kind of talks about, uh, you know, choosing the right career, um, in, in the in a way that you don't have to go really find a career that the premise is really that if you figure out who you are and what you like and what you're good at that the career will essentially choose you mm -hmm. and that and that's kind of what happened to me in the sense that I really fell into assistant direct assistant directing you know I just I didn't know what assistant directing was but if I did I would have chosen it a long time ago you know because um I love scheduling. I love budgeting. I've always been the super organized person. God bless you, um, sir. God bless you, sir. I can't do that. God, that's <laughs> I mean, why we need first ADs. I, I can't do I that. I mean, <laughs> I was the, the editor of my school newspaper in high school, and I was telling my peers what to do. And, you know, today <laughs> I'm telling my peers what to do. You know, so it's kind of a similar thing. Um, so I talk about my, my personal story in the book, but I make it, you know, broad. That it's not just about filmmaking. It's really about, about careers. Um, but I, I do give some help, helpful hints for those that want to pursue the film industry. And, and it, so the website is the career chose me.com and, and it is available on Amazon. Very cool. Um, I'll put that in the show so, notes. Good. Now um, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Yeah. I mean, I think like we talked about college earlier, the, the question is whether or not to pursue college and then, I mean, because you may it may not be 
the best thing. And, and two, where to live. Because, you know, the, the market is, you know, so fragmented now. You know, I'm, I'm, well, I'm producing this movie in Louisiana right now. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But, right. um, you know, I also live in Los Angeles. And um, so, you know, you can really live in a lot of different places. So it's, it's looking where, where are the tax credits. And right now in Atlanta and Louisiana, those could be good markets to live in. Um, yes, you could go to Los Angeles or New York, but the competition is so heavy. Mm-hmm. So you just have to really, you know, <laughs> think about do you want to be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a, in a big pond? Um, and, uh, you know, so where do you live? Um, and, um, but I, I think, you know, being self aware is very important. And um, I think that's one of the biggest things for most people is they're not enough self-aware mm-hmm. and you know so uh, my, my biggest downfall was I was like I want to be a DP for a decade and you know I was okay I, I mean I could I could be a, gr- a fine camera operator or I could shoot video mm-hmm. but when it comes down to it I, I'm not great with math F you know trying to figure out what f-stop doesn't <laughs> come natural to me mm-hmm. so it's not a great profession for me to choose if it doesn't come not necessarily easy, but I just don't enjoy that part of it, you know? So, um, if I would have realized that earlier on and and been more self-aware, if I would have asked more people, Hey, what do you think I'm good at? What do you think I should pursue? Um, I think that would have helped me, um, find this position, this AD line producer position earlier, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I I don't feel like I wasted that much time. You know? <laughs> I got gotcha, you. So, I got gotcha. you. So I don't know. Those those are, those are the main things. <clears throat> okay. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Hmm. I don't know if I know that. There's so many books. You know, there. I don't know if there's one book, but I will say that when I was in high school, I became a voracious reader. Like mm-hmm. I just started re- reading dozens of books on leadership and that was something that topic of leadership Mm -hmm. i think has affected the way that i i try to work and work with people Mm -hmm. um and i think if you can understand leadership and how people want to be treated um because that's a huge part of my job is is trying to lead people and and educate people um and trying to make the right decision you know and um but um read a lot yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i mean yeah but i mean re- read nonfiction. i mean i i'm a big nonfiction reader i guess so, so i just yeah, so well, I, lo- I love business books i love non you know uh, there is a book a great book about assistant directing by um i can't remember the name of it but it's um it'll come to me later <laughs> <laughs> i'll put it in the, i'll put i'll put some i'll her, put some links in the yeah, show notes her, yeah so um, uh, now, what lesson took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Um, lesson took me the longest to learn. Um, I don't know. That's a tough question. <laughs> no worries. In life, um, no. I, I think one, one thing that I realized a couple years ago was to stop waiting f- for jobs. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, yeah. like I, I can always apply for something off Craigslist or I can apply for something off Mandy or, you know, wherever these job applications are. And that's great. Um, I, but I'm not going to depend on that to provide for me a job. Mm-hmm. Right. So I've got to go out there and like your podcast, I got to hustle. Mm-hmm. So. The, for me, that means, you know, I send a lot of cold emails to people that I don't know. I like you um, did to me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, I, you know, I, you know, I go to networking events, even though I hate networking and oh, I, I try to, yeah. I have a goal where I just meet one person, you know, I don't try to try to meet 10 people. I just meet one person. Um, you know, so th- there's small things. I, th- I think the biggest thing is for me is also is following up with people. They'll mm-hmm. say, hey, you know, hit me up in three months and I'll put it on my calendar and I'll hit them up in three months. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I think just having tenacity to, you know, keep bugging people sometimes. And I, I hate being the one to bug somebody, but I'm, you know, I'm known for that is, is got to hustle. You know, it's basically you know. the lesson is hustle and hustle, hustle. a lot, <laughs> hustle a lot. Hustle. Now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Three of my favorite films. Um, one of my favorite films is Magnolia by P.T. Anderson. Mm-hmm. And uh, not Steel Magnolias, because people confuse that. Uh, <laughs> Very different movies. <laughs> I know. I haven't even seen Steel Magnolias, so I don't know. But um, I just love the tracking shots in Magnolia. And oh, well, PT I just is love, PT. you know, the rain and the, and the, the frogs. falling frogs. And, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. So my other favorite movie is Zoolander. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> because I can quote the entire movie. Sure. Um the third movie, I don't, I don't know. I'd have to think. I mean, I love, I love spy films, so I just probably have to say like Born, one of the Born movies. Got I just it. think they're they're well made. Um, now, where can people find you? So people can find me. Uh, my my personal website is thefilmfixer.us, dot us, mm-hmm. and um, my email is brandon at radiantfirst dot com. Oh God, I'm um, sorry you did that. But all right, <laughs> I told you not to. But all right, now you're gonna get it. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And uh, let's see, I'm I, all my my social media handles are Radiant First, so you can look me up that way. And then assistantdirecting dot com. Um, yes, correct. Very cool, Brandon. Man, thank you so much for being on the show, man. You've dropped some first AD knowledge bombs on the tribe today. So I really appreciate it, man. Hey, really appreciate it, Alex. Thanks so much. I want to thank Brandon for coming on and dropping some first AD knowledge bombs on the tribe. If you want to get links to anything we discussed in this episode, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 254 to download the show notes. And guys, on a side note, I am working on another secret project, not a future film. I think I've discussed this before, but This is going to be huge. Uh, The biggest thing that I've ever done for the tribe, for filmmakers in general, and I really do hope it provides a tremendous amount of value because it's it's really, really a lot of work. But I am uh, working on that as we speak. So keep an eye out next couple, uh, next month or two for an announcement and then a launch, hopefully sometime in October, November sometime. But uh, just trust me, you guys are going to flip the hell out when uh, when I talk to you about it. So keep an eye out. And if you haven't already, head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave the show a good review on iTunes. It really helps us out a lot. I really appreciate it. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 